Hi, I'm Bill Newcott, and welcome to Lexington, Virginia, a lovely hilltop town in the Shenandoah Valley. Lexington is everything you'd hope for in a historic southern locale with a charming, sometimes quirky downtown where just about every building dates back to the Civil War and beyond. Walking through the streets of Lexington is a lot like walking through a movie set, and that's a fact not lost on generations of movie makers. Take this sign here, advertising a millinery shop. It looks pretty old. It's kind of old, but not that old. It's painted in 1992 by a movie studio art department to dress up the main street for Summersby, a Civil War era movie starring Richard Gere and Jodie Foster. I'm Bill Newcott, film critic for the Saturday Evening Post, and here's our look at cinema of the Civil War on movies for the rest of us. Summersby was just one in a century-long succession of major films set during the era of the American Civil War, a bloody family feud that set brother against brother and created social shockwaves that echo to this day the war has always provided filmmakers with a powerful canvas on which to paint stories of human adventure, tragedy, and heartbreak. The very first Civil War movies were made within the living memory of people who'd witnessed the war firsthand, and that gives many of them a distinctive newsreel-like quality. Look at it this way, The Birth of a Nation was released just 50 years after the last shot of the Civil War is fired. That's roughly the equivalent of a Vietnam War film being made today. Of course, the giant of silent era Civil War films was W.D. Griffith's epic, The Birth of a Nation. Today, we've become fixated on the film's blatant racism and glorification of the Ku Klux Klan. But there's no denying the stark authenticity of the film's sprawling battle scenes. West Point experts not only advised Griffith on Civil War battle strategies, they also provided him with actual Civil War artillery. You'll find dozens of service comedies about all of America's 20th century wars, but precious few about the war between the states, and the few that you'll find are, for the most part, utterly misconceived. One exception to that list is Buster Keaton's The General, which also happens to be recognized as one of the greatest films ever made. Perhaps Keaton gets away with making a Civil War comedy because the film is focused so intently upon his character, a love-struck locomotive engineer who, quite by accident, finds himself playing a role in a relatively bloodless skirmish between the two sides. Lovingly crafted by Keaton, every frame of the general resembles a Matthew Brady photograph come to life. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. And frankly, I'm pretty much done with Gone with the Wind. For more than 80 years, apologists have been waving off criticism of the film's egregious depiction of happy slaves and idyllic plantation life. But even they've got to admit that the opening title scroll, shown here, a peon to knights and their ladies of master and of slave, seems to our ears light years beyond merely tone deaf. But if Gone with the Wind must take the blame for glorifying the great lost cause, then the film must also get credit for what may be the single most compelling Civil War scene ever filmed. The moment when Scarlett O'Hara wanders into the Atlanta train station, which has become a way station for wounded Confederate soldiers. In a positively horrific crane shot, the camera pulls away to a vantage point far above, revealing a nightmare scape of twisted, broken bodies. For 60 seconds, Gone with the Wind becomes one of the most powerful anti-war movies ever to come out of Hollywood. Have you heard the news, Henry? It would be more than a decade before another truly classic Civil War movie would come out of Hollywood, but John Huston's The Red Badge of Courage was worth the wait. Working with an outline based on Stephen Crane's short novel, Huston shatters all the conventions of Civil War films. Instead of confronting the audience with one rousing battle scene after another, Huston's Civil War plays out in long, uncomfortable close-ups of his actors' faces. Where Gone with the Wind and D.W. Griffith go all out to capture the bloody spectacle of war, Houston goes small, examining the millions of private wars that rage in the minds and hearts of each and every soldier called on to fight. The red badge of courage clocks in at just over an hour, but in the glassy eyes and tight jaws of his cast, Houston encompasses the entire human history of war. We are from Tennessee. How about y'all? We're from Ohio. I ain't never spoke to nobody from Ohio before. I never spoke to nobody from Tennessee. Most people have not seen The Red Badge of Courage, but almost no one has seen A Time Out of War, an Oscar-winning short film from 1954. What's your name, Sonny? Alden. Mine's Craig. 
Made as a college film project, the movie tells the story of three soldiers, two Union and one Confederate, who encounter each other across a narrow river and, instead of shooting, sit down and talk for a spell. How's your tobacco, Craig? Bully. How's your coffee and tack, Alden? First rate. It's a film that's rough around the edges, but the unpolished quality makes it almost a piece of cinematic folk art, a hastily drawn memory of shared humanity. A Time Out of War is available on YouTube. Seek it out and prepare to be spellbound. Craig? Good night. Good night, Connor. Ten years after the Civil War, the French science fiction author Jules Verne used it as the jumping off spot for one of his most successful novels, Mysterious Island. The thrill-packed 1961 British film version sticks close to Verne's original premise. A group of Union Civil War soldiers escapes from a Confederate prisoner of war camp by commandeering an observation balloon, which gets caught up in a storm and whisks them to a remote island that is, well, really mysterious. The film adds a Confederate soldier to the mix, and his presence actually magnifies the subtext that Verne was laying down in Mysterious Island. These men, so recently engaged in a nation-shattering death battle, must now cooperate with each other, and even trust each other, in order to survive. This is especially true, the film tells us, when it comes to battling enormous crabs. The governor is proposing to raise a regiment of Negro soldiers. Throughout the 1980s and 90s, filmmakers found new and thoughtful ways to address America's darkest years. Glory gave long overdue honor to the all African American unit that distinguished itself at the Second Battle of Fort Wagner. Ain't no dream. We run away slave, but we come back fighting. With riveting performances by Denzel Washington and Morgan Freeman, Glory is almost unbearably sad while remaining rousingly triumphant. At more than four and a half hours, Gettysburg managed to be both a compelling war drama and a college-level course in the Civil War's most famous battle. Writer-director Ron Maxwell enlisted an all-star cast to become the ultimate team of Civil War reenactors, and his depiction of the Battle of Round Top remains one of the most harrowing scenes of hand-to-hand -hand forest fighting ever filmed. And may I present to this court the Honorable Jared Hopkins, Esquire. The story of Andersonville, the notorious Confederate prisoner of war camp, has been well known since the war's end. But for a two-part 1997 TV movie, director John Frankenheimer unwound a tortured story of the evils men can inflict upon one another, even when they're supposedly on the same side. In Andersonville, a gang of Union prisoners rides roughshod over the rest of the population, robbing, beating, and even killing their fellow POWs. Finally, the Union soldiers stage a behind bars court martial of the gang members, and it falls to one soldier to provide their defense. Did I understand you to say that no law applies in here? You did indeed, Corporal. And that is the very point. Second Kansas Cutter Infantry, they fought bravely at Jenkins Ferry. That's right, sir. They killed a thousand rebel soldiers, sir. They were very brave and making $3 less each month than white soldiers. Steven Spielberg's Lincoln is primarily about the last days of the 16th president, but it's also an account of the end of the war and how Lincoln planned to heal the nation's wounds. Visiting a battleground, Daniel Day Lewis's Lincoln encounters two black soldiers, one solicitous, another defiant. The road ahead is fraught with dangers, and all three men can clearly see that. What would you do after the war? Work, sir. Perhaps you'll hire me. Perhaps I will. In the 100 plus years since filmmakers started examining the Civil War, they have adopted progressively more nuanced views of the conflict. In any war movie, there is always the danger of falling into that trap of glorifying the violence or sanctifying the sacrifices without taking a moment to reflect on humankind's deep-seated, often senseless instinct to inflict damage on each other. And that's why we're going to end with this little speech by Jimmy Stewart, who gave it in a film called Shenandoah. He's a rancher who's been desperately trying to remain neutral in the war between the states. He loves people on both sides of the conflict, and he can't understand why the disagreements of men 
have come to this. It's like all wars, I suppose, the undertakers are winning it. Well, the politicians will talk a lot about the glory of it, and the old men will talk about the need of it. The soldiers, they just want to go home. My thanks to the wonderful folks here in Lexington, Virginia, a town that's been welcoming filmmakers for the better part of a century. For example, walk down Main Street a couple of blocks, and you'll find yourself on the campus of Virginia Military Institute, where in 1938, Hollywood arrived in town to make a big screen adaptation of the Broadway play, Brother Rat. Danny boy, what do you want? One of the young co-stars was a fellow named Ronald Reagan. He didn't have the lead role, but he walked off with the actress who played his romantic interest in the film and was soon married to Jane Wyman. Polite indifference from the opposite sex is the fate of a woman wearing glasses. <laughs> Well, you're not wearing them now. In the campus bookstore, you can still buy a black and white VMI sweater, just like the one Ronnie wore. The hills and valleys around Lexington, Virginia are an idyllic panorama of wineries, horse farms, and cattle fields. But that bucolic peace and quiet was shattered 2005, when this tranquil landscape was transformed into a fiery Armageddon as bloodlusting Martians did battle with the armies of Earth in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Tanks roared along dirt roads, refugees marched in silent shock, and Tom Cruise ran, and ran, and ran. Lexington, Virginia is just a few hours from Washington, D.C., and walking these sidewalks is like walking not only in the country's history, but the history of film as well. I'm Bill Newcomb. When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah, the men will hear the boys will shout, the ladies they will all turn out and we'll all stay again when Johnny comes marching home and we'll all